Hello, and welcome to Occupy Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Peter Beinart, a non-resident fellow at FMEP. Today is March 1st, 2024, and I'm delighted to be here with uh, Rania Batrice, one of FMEP's 2024 Palestinian non-resident fellows. Rani is an activist and strategist for progressive change, a public relations specialist and a political consultant. Rani has worked as a democratic operator for over 20 years, lending her expertise across political nonprofit, legislative strategy and crisis management, both in the United States and around the world. For Bernie Sanders 2016 run for president, she served as Iowa communications director, the national director of surrogates and as deputy campaign manager. Ronnie and I have sat down together to talk about U.S. politics and Israel-Palestine before. We're going to put links to our past FMVP webinars in the show notes. And I wanted to talk to her about where we are now in this election year and at wartime. Ronnie, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Peter. Um, so this past, this earlier this week was the Michigan primary uh, in which a group of people organized to vote uncommitted in the Democratic primary as a protest against the Biden administration's policy in Gaza. Um, I'd love to ask you a little bit about how this idea came about, this idea of using the vote of, uh, the vote of uncommitted as a protest. Yeah, so it was, you know, some local uh, organizers, of course, in uh, across the state, but but obviously in, in Dearborn and Detroit and some other areas who um, Michigan is one of a few states that has an actual uncommitted line on their uh, primary ballot. So where we saw, for example, in New Hampshire, there was an effort to write in ceasefire and some other things. This is an actual line on the ballot that is uncommitted. It's a bubble you can fill out for uncommitted. So uh, so these these local uh, incredible, wonderful organizers came together and, and, and on, it was really like in just a few weeks, they were able to come together and really kind of put the full court press on, sorry for the sports analogy, but, yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, and make this a priority and a concerted effort among democratic voters in the state of Michigan, which obviously we all, we know that there is a, a significant Arab population, uh, within the state of Michigan. So, and, and, you know, we saw it was, it was not, um, despite try as they may to downplay the results. It was, it was very, it was quite, quite an incredible turnout. Uh, on the un uncommitted side. Yeah, so could you talk a little bit about, the, about what you think the right metric is to gauge how many, how much success they actually did have in, in getting people to vote uncommitted? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so it was over 100,000 uh, voters who who vote, who did vote uncommitted. And I think it's around 14%, 13 point something percent that in the end. Uh, and I, you know, there is, it's, tough to say because it's it's obviously it's it's a primary for an incumbent so mm -hmm. turnout tends to be a little bit less than usual in these kinds of situations but we also have other um years to look at where you know when when uh president obama was up for re-election there was i think it was twenty thousand people voted uncommitted so we have some things to sort of compare this to so the fact that we've got a hundred over a hundred thousand people who turned out in a coordinated effort and voted uncommitted is significant. So I, I think, again, try as some may to, to downplay it. It's We have something to look at in the past and this is considerably more than than that. I think that would have been 2012, and, yeah. <laughs> and and looking at, at where the uncommitted votes came from, um, obviously there was a strong push in, in Arab American communities, but I'm curious about what you saw in the, in the vote that might've suggested other kind of demographic groups in Michigan that might have also been inclined to vote uncommitted. Yeah, and this is, um, to me, it's not surprising because this has been even pre-October 7th, there's been a lot of frustration among, I mean, black communities, Latino communities, youth and young people. And I do think in Michigan in particular, we saw young people turning out and voting uncommitted as well for you know these different campus areas um, came out in, in good numbers to to vote uncommitted. And and it's really it's it's unfortunate because 
I feel like this administration has been ignoring these groups for quite some time. And it, there, what, there's that saying that idiom, it's like, you know, you, we're going to give you crumbs and pretend like it's a feast. That's been happening for quite some time now. Young people have been feeling it, not just on this issue, on climate, on gun violence, on a number of issues. This happens to be, um, I mean, it's we're watching genocide unfold in front of our eyes. It's not something you can ignore or, or or slap a talking point onto. So I do think that the 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 young people that turned out, that's pretty significant too. And if, you know, if I'm President Biden and his administration and his campaign, I am I'm paying attention. I don't know that they are, but that's what I would be doing. So as the primary goes forward, um I mean, obviously, there's not they're not strong opposition candidates, but I'm curious where there might be other states that um, because they might also have a, an uncommitted line or there, or because of there's organizing potential there that you could that, that may try to replicate what Michigan has done. Yeah, and I think I think even more than replicate, definitely the states, you know, Colorado, Washington State, we even saw I think it was it was either yesterday, or the day before, you know, Union in Colorado actually came out and endorsed uncommitted which is very it's unprecedented and and it's a it's a very clear statement about where we are as a nation um so i do think that that organizing in similar ways in some of these states makes sense but i think more than it being uh, apples to apples replicated it's more about um the the local organizing efforts to make a, a very clear statement that we are not being represented. You know, it's it's a little bit trite to say, you know, we elect these people to represent us, but it's true. They represent us. And for some reason, I mean, anywhere between 70 and 80% of Democrats support a, a permanent ceasefire and we can't, that's not being heard. And how is that? Why is that? So, and I think we know there's, there's a number of reasons why, but one of them are, you know, special interests and, and the lobbies in this country have, have a, a, a stranglehold in a lot of ways. And so I, I do think when I think about replicated efforts, I'm thinking about local on the ground organizing, not necessarily that it is exactly what Michigan did. Right. Um, I mean, do you think there is anything that the Biden administration could do? Let's say there was a, a hostage deal uh, and a, a long term pause that was negotiated, you know, by next week. And they managed to turn that into a situation in which the war never restarted, basically. Um, and so they were able to get to a ceasefire, even if they didn't call it a ceasefire at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Is how much of the just as a political matter, I mean, if both of us, I think, would agree that that, that would be you know the, the the something that would the right thing to do but would but at a, as a political matter given the slaughter that's already taken place um that that is politically the the damage already done i mean is there anything that that joe biden could do at this point that would actually get people to be willing to organize to turn out for him in the fall who people who really care about this issue yeah i, I it's 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 so difficult because you how do you how do you move past more than 30,000 people massacred how do you move past more than 13,000 children massacred not to mention i mean we just heard yesterday you know a 2 month old literally starved to death the day before it was 17 year i mean we're literally watching this unfold and it's not and it it does drive me a little bit crazy we're seeing a little more now when people saying you know palestinians are starving to death no they're being starved uh -huh, uh -huh. and so you so it's it's really 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 difficult to say oh yeah joe biden do this thing and then we're all we're all good uh -huh. um because it's it's too it's too much like this devastation is too much it's too deep so it, it's hard to point to that, but I, I do think, I will first say that I feel very strongly that everything he's done, him and the administration have done to date 
on behalf of Palestinians has been unbelievably performative. I mean, there's nothing behind it. And I, I've, I've talked about this publicly, just it's like this politely asking Netanyahu to stop carrying out genocide while circumventing Congress and sending more bombs. And then, and then, you know, saying, oh, but we really, Net, we've talked to Netanyahu about uh, d reducing the the impact on civilians and the and I'm just like what what like backwards twilight zone are we living in right now where we have we live in a country where our president is uniquely positioned to put an end to this and is doing the opposite so so I, I just have to preface with all of that. I do feel like if he were to do something significant, and I mean conditioning to funding, I mean um, a, 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 a stop. There are they're announcing new settlements. Of course, we've all seen this. The and the and then the you know the EO the executive order he signed that 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 impacts settlers. It's for settlers. So like something actually significant and real. I think that we could at least start a good faith conversation from there but yeah. everything everything that's happened to this point has been so offensively performative yeah. that it's hard to imagine like we can't we have no starting point right now as far as i'm concerned and i say this as a lifelong democrat who helped right. get him elected right. who <laughs> you know who who's worked in this space for so long but i'm just so disgusted as are so many as are so many people, not even just Palestinians. I mean, anybody that stands on the side of humanity can't see what's going on here and not just be speechless. So all of this to say, to answer your question, I, I think that if, if he were to do something significant, we could start a conversation. If, if this continues, the performative stuff continues, I mean, more people are dying, children are dying. Like what's what's the... How do you even have a conversation with somebody who's who can't can't see that as a problem? Right. Do you think that the fact that people in the administration and in the campaign, do you just think that they they for that they didn't they're not in touch or were not in touch with um, not just with Arab Americans, but with other groups of people who were really being appalled by what happened. So they just didn't really understand the depth of the response. They were kind of isolated from this. I mean, is that because, what does that say about the way the Democratic Party kind of functions? And for, sorry, I get, I'm feeling myself getting really frustrated because you're, you're exactly right. And part of my frustration is, again, this isn't new. And I don't even mean it's not new with Palestinians. I mean, this is not new within the demographics that always, always, always show up and elect Democrats. So um, first of all, I do think it was a horrendous political calculation that they were not expecting. I think that President Biden was thinking about um, November. And, and thought that this was the correct political calculation. And and because to your point, they are so out of touch with the reality of what is the what is our limit, you know, as Americans, as human beings that live in this country that understand what our taxpayers are going to pay for or not pay for. What is our limit? I think it was a wild miscalculation. But again, I, it's also not new. I mean, as it, 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 again, back to the the, the black community that so many have been organizing for literal decades for reparations, for climate justice, for gun violence prevention efforts within communities, for all of these things. And they and sort of get patted on the head and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, you know, we'll get there maybe. Or, or they'll do some, again, some performative ridiculous thing and not actually deliver anything. Meanwhile, it's not a secret that that black people, especially black women, continue to deliver for Democrats. And so what is the limit there? And then we see what's happening, honestly, with immigration as well. And and the, the games that are being played, the negotiations that are being made um, on, on that front, too. And so and again, and then back to young people who 
one of the things I really love about young people, and I work with with so many young people, one of the things I love is they're beholden to nobody. So the idea that young people are going to fall in line because of an R or a D or whatever, just not going to happen. And they have been organizing diligently for years and years now around, again, things like climate, around gun violence prevention, around justice issues, and they are wildly with us on Palestinian sovereignty and self-determination. And I think we're seeing all of these things play out. And I think it was completely ignored. I also think that maybe part of the political miscalculation was just how desperate Netanyahu would be and is for this to go on as long as possible. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously in his best interest. And so I, I think all of these things, which unfortunately is our country has a history of having horrible foreign policy and no actual policies, just like shoot first, ask questions later. And I think this is the latest example. I mean, I try to think about it from their point of view, and I wonder if they may have thought, and I've heard parts of this from people, some people is that, look, you if you pick a fight with Benjamin Netanyahu, a big fight with Benjamin Netanyahu, he's not going to roll over. In fact, it might be good for him politically for his own reasons to have that fight. Yeah. And he's not, it's not necessarily the same as having a fight with a lot of other foreign leaders because you, the Republicans in Congress will be on his side. And mm -hmm. Some of the Democrats, maybe many of the Democrats. I mean, can can you be sure if you pick a fight with Benjamin Netanyahu that Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries will stand with Joe Biden, right? I mean, the politics on this issue in Washington, maybe not out in the country now, but still in Washington, are such that that I wonder whether Joe Biden and his advisors thought we don't want to pick a fight here because we think we might lose. Um, um, you know, I still remember when Barack Obama. Um, you know, picked a fight with Netanyahu over the settlement freeze. And Harry Reid went to speak at APAC and threw Obama under the bus. And so, again, trying maybe, you know, trying to get inside of their head, I wonder whether they just, they have a calculate a kind of cold hearted calculation of the politics in Washington that, that felt that they just didn't have the room to do that. I, 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 I don't disagree with that. I think that's all, it's always going to be true. And it, it, the to me the the like you know Hakeem Jeffries is a vote, Chuck Schumer is a vote, um, but the American people are <laughs> are who are going to elect people or not elect people. And so I don't I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. But that's always going to be true. And at some point, at some point, this country and the leaders in this country have to decide what side of humanity that they stand on. I mean, and I don't think history is not going to be kind to, to, to Joe Biden and, and everyone else that's sort of supporting and excusing and funding and facilitating what's happening. Um, and I, I, I feel very confident in that when, when the book is written, I mean, this is not going to look, this is going to be his legacy. Um, and there's all kinds of other things, good and bad, that he's done. But I think this will be his legacy. And, and so it's it's one of those situations where, you know, at what point do we as a nation stand up and say, like, this is this is not OK. And literally, are, as as people are being told, we can't address child hunger and poverty and health care disparities and climate change and reparations and all these things we're told all these things are way too expensive we can't deal with that in our country but we always have the funds mm -hmm. to send billions and billions of more dollars trillions really in, in, in total um to drop bombs on people mm -hmm. I, like that to me at some point that has to prevail in the in the calculus and and i do think I do think that that probably was part of the calculus, but but they just completely, completely ignored or weren't aware. I don't. I honestly don't know. I, I think it maybe was a lack of awareness of where the American people would fall on this. Like what our 
to be just totally crass. What is our appetite for something like this? Mm -hmm. I think they completely ignored that. And it was all very political. And that's, I mean, that's a problem. And Ani, what do you say? I'm sure you have these conversations all the time to Democratic politicians who say, I completely agree with you, um, but I look, but but I want to get elected and I don't want my life to be, um, I don't want to have to be dealing with headaches about this issue all the time. I have other things I want to be dealing with. And I look at what Jamal Bowman is going through and I look at what Summer Lee is going through. And I think, uh, you know, as we Jews might say, like, I need that like a hole in the head. Like, you know, like I'd rather be just one of these many, many other members of Congress who basically, you know, who basically does takes the uncontroversial position and and uh, basically can stay in office and work on the issues that I want to work on. Um, how do you make the case to those folks that actually they need to take this on? So it, it, a, a couple things here. One one of the things I just said was just is how history will remember this and what. So if we're thinking, if P, and I mean I don't know a member of Congress. I love the people that I work with, but I don't know any member of Congress that isn't concerned about their legacy. <laughs> um, so. That's one piece of it. The other piece of it is what I just was talking about in reference to what, what we are not spending money on here, what we are not investing on here. And mm -hmm. with with Summer, with Jamal, with Cor with so many of these members, with, I mean, my God, Richie Torres, who I we could have a whole episode just on that. We won't, I won't go there right now, but I've got thoughts and feelings. But I mean, his district is suffering. He is suffering so deeply and he is a mouthpiece for APAC. And and his own constituents are like, hey, you know, hello, we're we're starving to death here too. We don't have healthcare here too. We don't, you know, rising poverty, et cetera. And so th those are the kinds of conversations. And I do think actually it's important that we have them not just with members of Congress, but writ large, because there is a sentiment among some that like, why are we even talking about this? This doesn't affect my life. And I'm like, what? but it does. It does. And so with members, with other just like people out in, in the world, I, I think this is, it's an important part of it um, that we, and we have to thread that needle that we are investing in genocide and not in supporting people in our own country. I mean, I, I don't know how many, I don't have children, but I have lots of, I've got kids and I have lots of friends with kids and, and just listening to how much they're paying for childcare in this country is, you, you know what I mean? There's all these very real life things that we are not addressing mm -hmm. here. And meanwhile can, can send billions of dollars in emergency funds overseas. So yeah. that that's at least in part the conversation I tend to have. And then, you know, people like Jamal and Summer and, and others too, one of the things I respect so much about them is they know it's, they know it's hard. They know it puts an even bigger target on their back, yeah. but they are so uh, committed to justice and humanity uh -huh. everywhere, not uh -huh. just picking and choosing. Uh -huh. that that they take that on and and you know quite frankly I wish we had more people like that do you think I was listening to you talk about this argument about not sending the money over there when we have such needs at home I, you know it's curious it's funny if you take that out of if you if you move that conversation from Israel to let's say Ukraine or other places you know you, and you think about someone like Tucker Carlson right there's actually a significant audience in the Republican Party you know America first right which is not a moral mm -hmm. argument, um, but it is an argument about taking care of Americans, right? Not taking care, of, not not focusing on other places. I wonder whether you think there is any potential for that kind of perspective to get traction in the Republican Party to lead more Republicans to say, you know, we should be spending this money at home. We shouldn't be spending it on Israel's wars. Yeah, I, I feel like Ukraine is a little bit different because of the global geopolitical implications, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Um, but to your point, yes, I do think, I mean, I feel this way, honestly, I think we have failed as Democrats in a number of spaces, this being one of them, that there is this, and I'm not, I don't believe in isolationism. And I, I, I like that all kind of makes me 
a little uncomfortable. My, my point is more that we have plenty to go around, like right. when when we decide that things are priorities. Um, but but to your point, I do think that this is something that we need to do a better job of. It, and quite frankly, even in evangelical and and uh, uh, religious spaces too, on on kind of the Christian religious right, where uh, the again we could have a whole conversation about just this, but point being, you know, the idea that we are um, stewards of the planet and meant to sort of protect and take care of each other, and these are theoretically ideas that you subscribe to if you are if you fall in the, into that category and so how do you justify this kind of pain and suffering at home mm -hmm. or in Palestine um mm -hmm. so anyway I do I do think that that's I think you bring up a very important good point that this is there is there's hypocrisy on all sides um that that we see kind of at play here tell me what you think this organizing what the implications longer term implications beyond this election are going to be for our american political engagement i think I, this is such an important question to me because historically and and we see this across a lot of immigrant communities um my my family included where you know you make it here to the us and you, you, you're feeling sort of the safety and stability of, of being here. And there, I do think that there's this, I mean, this is not 100%, obviously, but, but I do think that there tends to be this sentiment of, okay, we're here, we're safe, keep your head down, do the work, like be successful in sort of all those conventional ways and and be able to take care of your family and and grow and, and be of the community, but don't put your head up too much. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a little bit of sort of the idea of assimilation uh, and not rocking the boat as, as immigrants. And um, I think that our community has played a part in that as well from a electoral engagement, like civics kind of perspective and also from a um, monetary perspective. I mean, we have a lot as a community, we have a lot of funds. We have a lot of money and, and it, we're seeing uh, investment a little bit more over the last few cycles within like campaigns and things like that, but it hasn't been necessarily um, a big concerted organized effort. I do see just a massive shift happening on that front and I think it's become untenable. Like we can't do nothing. We can't say nothing. Um, I say this as somebody who's worked in the space for more than two decades. So like there are others <laughs> like me, obviously, but just as a community at large, I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more engagement, a lot more investment in very intentional, strategic, almost surgical ways that we haven't necessarily seen before, I mean, I think there is an understanding that we as a community are a large voting block and could make a difference within districts and nationally as well. So um, that I, I think I see that shift happening. Hmm. I mean, I know historically many Arab Americans actually voted Republican. I mean, do you think that there is a possibility? Obviously, the Republican Party is not very inviting, I would imagine, right now. But do you think that the, uh, there's the possibility of Arab Americans you know, looking away from the Democratic Party and, and looking to see whether the, the Republican Party could be open uh, or are essentially our Americans essentially have no choice uh, but to stick with the Democratic Party in some form because, you know, because the Trump Republican Party is so openly racist. Yeah, I, I, I think especially as we see like first and second and third generations of, of immigrant families coming through, I definitely see them more sh like over the last several cycles shifting more toward Democrats yeah. um, for all the reasons you uh -huh. you listed. Uh, but I but I also think right now in this moment, there is such a frustration with this with the Biden administration that. I, I am I, I do also just want to warn there are some efforts out there 
where it is actually Republicans saying like running certain things to 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 turn people away from Biden. So I want to make sure like as people are moving out in the world, like do your research and all and make sure you understand who's behind what. But you mean using I the do, Gaza issue to 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 depress. Yes, like uh, yeah, exactly. And and I say this as somebody who again is wildly frustrated with this administration and and honestly I'm not I don't I don't this will be the first presidential election since the year 2000 that I will not be involved in um so I'm I'm saying this as like just understand intent um I think that's important but but I do think these younger generations have shifted they're they're more progressive um and and they've shifted more toward Democrats in general. I think this cycle is going to just be very difficult for a lot of people because Donald Trump scares the hell out of a lot of us, myself included, and there's real consequences there. But we can't just turn it around and pretend like the genocide isn't happening and that Biden isn't facilitating it. And so, you know, I... I don't I don't expect like a mass exodus to the Republican Party. I do think that there's going to be a lot of people who may not turn out to vote, may not uh, vote at the top of the ticket, which we saw. We saw this a lot in 2016, honestly. I mean, this is a very different situation, but um, but we saw it a lot in 2016 and, and rarely is we talk about people not showing up to vote, but we don't talk about people skipping the top of the ticket. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's a very real, uh, a very real risk that that's that we're facing. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting because generally speaking, the top of the ticket is what pulls the bot, you know, the, right. the down right. ballot races. And I think we're in a completely flipped scenario now where the, the down ballot races are going to have to pull people out. Um, because let's be honest, I'm going to get myself in trouble for saying this, but I don't really care. W nobody was excited about Joe Biden before all of this. Right, so like, right, right, the reality right. is now it, there's a lack of excitement and there's genocide yeah. and there's frustration and there's just this, this, you know, deep feeling of being um, completely ignored. So I, I don't have all the answers, definitely, but yeah. I, I don't, like I said, I don't see a mass exodus to to Republicans necessarily, but but unfortunately not showing up or not voting at the top is a real a reality. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard from people over the years um, is that there are Palestinians in politics, even in elective office, in various other positions of influence who essentially pass uh, without being publicly recognized as Palestinian. Or maybe people who are not who are Arab American are not publicly. I mean, I think famously like the Sununu family in New Hampshire, right, is a very yeah. you know been a very prominent political family. I think they are at least partly Palestinian, as I understand it. But the, I've never heard them, you know, have any many. And I, I think I never heard Justin Amash, the congressman, for Republican, liber, you know, Tea Party congressman from Michigan, say anything about it until I think he tweeted that he had a whole bunch of family members who were killed in Gaza. Yeah. And again, I. I imagine this must be true, not just, but throughout all kinds of different American institutions that matter. Are you seeing any move by Palestinian Americans or by Arab Americans more broadly in response to this to actually essentially become, speak out and 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 and, and be more engaged um, because of what's happening? I, I, well, I, I do see a generational divide here. And this is, based on anecdotal, what I've seen, uh, conversations uh, I've had, not necessarily like numbers or research, but anecdotally, I, I do see a generational divide where younger Arabs and Palestinians are very proudly, loudly declaring their, you know, their presence. Um, and, and I do think it has, I, I think that generational divide Again, my theory here, not based in science, but I do think it is partially in that that desperation to assimilate and that desperation for safety, especially people who have made it here from such horrendous, horrendous uh, struggle and 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 war and strife and and you know refugees and all all the things. So I think that there is a 
there is a fear. And I, I even, I think about my own family where, I mean, from a very, very young age, it was sort of like, just be of the community. Don't say you're a Palestinian. Don't, it was, of course, I was always very stubborn, even as a small child. So I was like, I'm Palestinian, but, um, but I do think that there is some of that like fear based. We keep ourselves safe by assimilating and not othering ourselves. Meanwhile, the entirety of the population is otherizing us on their own. And so, um, you know, I, I do think there is that still at play with our parents, our grandparents and that, that sort of, um, generation, but I do see younger people just out like loud and proud. Uh, and part of that too, honestly, is this, this coalition and, and collective that's been so intersectional that's come together in support of Palestine has, it is it is so big and it is so intersectional that I think we collectively maybe are starting to feel a sense of cover too of like it's okay to say I'm Palestinian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting listening to you thinking that what it made me think about is I think if one to understand APAC, um, I've always felt uh, especially APAC uh, in as it emerged in the in the in the in the eighties and seventies was that a lot of those folks were people who felt somewhat ashamed that their parents' generation in the forties uh, in the thirties and the forties had been too timid to really challenge the Roosevelt administration, and so because they felt much more comfortable, fully Americanized, um, that they felt they were going to kind of announce their presence in America by, you know, by using their political weight very forcefully in this narrative of, you know, protecting Jews. I mean, to me, I think, of course, I think it was, it's tragic that they decided to do it in this way, because I don't think it's been, I don't think um, it's been good for 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 Jews or anybody else. Um, but it is interesting the way in which that dynamic of a kind of immigrant generation and then a second and a third generation plays itself out. And I think in some ways it was the trauma of and the shame of American Jewish lack of political response to the Holocaust that produced these aftershocks. And it sounds like in some ways you're potentially telling a somewhat different story in which from this horror will be a new resolve to be much more much more openly involved in politics to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very important point. And and I obviously I agree with you, especially what it's what it's turned into today is is really upsetting and disappointing and all all the all the things. Uh but I but it makes, you know, it makes sense. And the and there is this tendency to sort of I think it's human nature sometimes to overcorrect. You know, to to sort of uh, whether you are of the community that's been harmed or of the community that did not do enough. I mean, I think we see it in Germany a bit, too, just sort of at large. It's like, yeah, it happened and you should be sorry. Uh -huh. And this is atrocious. But your course correction is causing more harm. And then you're right. what are you going to like? Right. What does that overcorrection look like? You know what right. I mean? And so it's right. kind of like six cycle we continue to right. be on. And, and I am, I can be very squishy and fuzzy and whatever on this, but I like, I, at the end of the day, to me, we're all citizens of the planet first, right. you know, we're all human beings first. And right. And God, if we could just start from that place, if we could right. just see each other as human, right. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what ethnicity you are. I don't care about any of those things. Can we just be human to each other? Right, right. And as you're saying, I mean, that you do see glimpses of that in this movement for, uh, for a ceasefire and this movement more broadly for Palestinian freedom, that it is bringing together people from all kinds of different backgrounds, like other movements have in American history, um, uh, that people see a kind of fundamental moral question, including, you know, a significant number of Jews as well. And so it seems to me absolutely. that's a, that's something to take some hope from amidst this really dark. Yeah, time. absolutely. Abs and God, we have to find it anywhere, I feel like, but, right. but you're exactly right. And it is, you know, I, I will tell you for me, um, in large part, it was first 
my black friends and my Jewish friends that checked in first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that to me is, it makes sense. You know what I mean? It makes yeah. a lot of sense that that's, uh, it, it still means everything to me. And I know people like me who are working in these spaces and trying to figure out how to just exist here um, while keep, keep continuing to move forward and push for change. Um, but, but there is, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a commonality. There is a, a shared struggle that I think we, we all recognize, uh, or I shouldn't say we all, but a lot of us recognize uh, and it, and it matters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Rania, for joining me today. Uh, thank you to our listeners for tuning into this episode of Occupied Thoughts. Please make sure to check out the FMVP website, fmvp.org, for resources related to this podcast and lots of other rich content related to Palestine and Israel. And please make sure you are subscribed to this podcast to stay up to date. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify, and you can also watch video versions of our podcast, including this one on YouTube. And with that, I'm Peter Beinart signing off until the next episode of FMVP's Occupied Thoughts.